ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us this coming live stream and uh, what we're about to read in it from the bi biography of the great Hassan al-Basri, one of the greatest scholars that our ummah has ever seen from the tabi'een. And he was somebody, why we say very clearly that he was one of the greatest mm -hmm. scholars. Simple reason. The Sahaba themselves were impressed with him. The kibar of the Sahaba, major, major Sahaba, were all impressed with the Hassan al-Basri. Amongst them, as Sayyid Aisha, when Hassan al-Basri grew up and was a speaker and was speaking to the people, Sayyid Aisha herself said, Man Who is this person who speaks with the words of the Siddiqeen? All right, Siddiq is like the highest level of, of, of piety and, and wilaya and knowledge. Okay, Anas ibn Malik said about Al Hassan al Basri, he said, when people started asking him questions and he became older, he said, Go to Hassan for he has he remembers everything, he's young and remembers, and we've gotten old and we've forgotten. Okay, so if the Sahaba, the Kibar Sahaba, endorsed this man. We know that his maqam and his rank is something special. It's something else completely. Uh, another thing that used to happen, his mother, Hassan al-Basri's mom, used to take him, and this is something that people should do. She used to take him around to the Sahaba and say, pray for my son. Make dua for them. Amongst them was Umar ibn Khattab. And he said, Allahumma faqihu fi deen wa habib ilayhi nas. Okay. Make him a faqih. Oh Allah, give him knowledge. And make the people love him. Okay. Hab, uh, make the people love him so that they could go and take uh Habibhu ila nas, make him beloved to the people so they could take knowledge from him. So that's Hassan al Basri, and that's who we're going to talk about today. And he has a lot of amazing stories. So uh Hassan al Basri, Imam al Ghazali said about him, his his speech was the closest to the speech of the prophets. His way, everything about him was in imitation of the ways of prophets and his hedi, his guidance, his his way was just like the Sahaba. How could it be otherwise when he was raised by the Sahaba? He met some of the greatest of Sahaba. He spent a lot of time with Jabir ibn Abdullah, Anas ibn Malik, okay? Ali ibn Abi Talib, many, many, Hassan and Hussein, many, many Sahaba did he spend time with. He was literally raised by them. His father was, was one of the, non-muslims who were captured during the battles of the sahaba and then he became a muslim and then he became a servant and he was assigned to zayd bin thabit the scribe of the prophet the, the famous scribe who was involved in all the compilations of the quran the quran was compiled of course two times and it was written five times so it was compiled once and he was zayd bin thabit was in charge of that for he was this the prophet's number one scribe of the quran and then in the time of Abu Bakr, he was in charge of gathering it. In the time of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, Zayd bin Thabit was in charge of writing down the, uh, uh, the Quran, right, literally having the Quran written, okay, uh, with the spelling of Quraysh. Him and four other members of Quraysh, they literally wrote the Quran cover to cover and they made uh, four or five copies of the Quran. All right, so his father was the servant of Zayd bin Thabit. Now his mother... So you see that the, the poor Muslims who love knowledge, Allah always takes from their from their offspring and elevates their offspring. There's a famous hadith the Prophet ﷺ is attributed to the Prophet ﷺ, some attributed to other than the Messenger, that it says, be one of four and not the fifth. Be a scholar, be learned, kun aliman, aw muta'alliman, or someone who's studying, right? Either someone who's learning, or a scholar, or someone who studies. Or khadiman lil ilm or serve the scholars there's always people who who are serving they they may not be students they may not be scholars but they're like the admins the volunteers the behind the scenes like the clock the well, the working of the clock behind the scenes they make everything move or muhibban lil ulama or be someone who loves them so his mother and his father they they were they were masakin they were poor they worked in the service business they were just servants of the sahaba but they loved knowledge and they believed. And his mother used to take him around and she took him to Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar ibn Khattab made dua for him. And Umm Salama was her employer. Who is Umm Salama? Wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So her employer was the wife of the messenger. 
And then he was born on the eighth year of Sayyidina Omar's Khilafah. So he was born 10 years after the passing of the messenger. She gave her name was Khaira. This woman's name was Khaira. Yeah. She gave birth to him. And at that time, she was working for Umm Salama. And she was too busy. They were very poor. So she would leave okay, uh, Hassan with Umm Salama. And it is said that Umm Salama would, would nurse him or even like busy, busy him, right? And I don't know if, uh, how she would nurse him because she didn't have children, but that she would just like breastfeed as if he was eating, right? And he would suckle, she would suckle him at her, at her breast. And sometimes some said that there was milk there, and some said no. She he was just that she would just rock him to sleep, and he would just suckle suck on her breast as a as a baby. And we we know that in the Sharia, a person could do this up to two years old. Okay, and so they say that the baraka of his knowledge is what he took from the association of Umm Salama and the du'a of Amr ibn Khattab and the companionship, and that the younger Sahaba were like his older brothers. So he was completely born. He's from the senior. Of the Tabi'een and Omar ibn Abdul Aziz named him the chief of the Tabi'een. And that there was only one time they said that there was only one person that of the Tabi'een. Tabi'een, remember, is second generation Muslim. They didn't meet the Prophet, but they met the companions. They said that there's only one person that he would ask knowledge from, and that was Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Beyond that, when they asked him a question, yeah, he may ask the companion, but he never had a need for any second generation Muslim, any Tabi'i. So he would only ask, the only time that they saw him asking another Muslim, a uh, tabi'i, was Sayyid ibn Musayyib. All right. That shows you the rank of Sayyid Musayyib and Hassan al-Basri. Ibn Sirin, one time, he, ha he had, his, his peer at that time was Ibn Sirin. So they, they met, and when Hassan al-Basri was beginning in his path, he had a vision, and he had a dream. And this dream upset him badly, because he, from what he knew of, of dreams, it was not good. And it, he saw himself naked on top of a garbage heap, striking the garbage heap with a stick. He was upset because clothes is mentioned as libas uh, taqwa is a symbol of taqwa in a dream. It's a symbol of protection of your aura. Aura is your nakedness is like symbolic of your bad deeds. It, it covers your bad, your flaws, and it's taqwa. And the clothes at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was interpreted as as dean, strong dean, like Omar said, Sayyidina Omar said, I had a dream of myself dragging my thobe, okay? And uh, and he was concerned because we know that we're not supposed to drag our thobe. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Omar, that is dean, okay? Dean. So to be naked, he was really upset, okay? And so he sent somebody and he was embarrassed to go to Ibn Sirin. The people said, Ibn Sirin is the best dream interpreter. He said, okay, you go to Ibn Sirin and tell him that you had the dream. Okay, Now, that always doesn't get you the best result because sometimes dream interpretation is based on the person who saw it and their circumstances. So that one came in and Ibn Sirin sort of brushed it aside. He said, what did he say? He said, uh, he brushed it aside. He said, okay, we have to go ourselves. So he, he went. Okay. Then when he put two and two together, that I brushed away the dream, then Hassan Basri, he said, oh, this dream is for Hassan Basri. And he said, this is your dream. And, it, and, the, and, the, uh, and the garbage heap is the dunya. And, not, and the clothes in this dream does not mean taqwa and deen. It means dunya. So you are free from the dunya, and you are on top of the dunya, meaning that you're, you, you're in domination of your desire for dunya. The desire for dunya has no grip. So you're being on top of the garbage heap, means that you're in domination of your desire for dunya and you're striking it is wisdom that you give to people about zuhud, right? Wisdom that you give to people about um, going without the dunya. And from the sayings of Hassan al-Basri is the, happy, the happiest you can be is when you disrespect the dunya, which doesn't mean like you throw money or something like that. It means that you don't allow this dunya to control you, right? You don't allow it to affect your moods. Al-Hajjaj, he lived in the time, mostly it was the Umayyad dynasty. But he did live in the time of, uh, of, um, of the Abbasids. When the, when the Abbasids took over, uh, before the Abbasids took over, the Umayyads utilized um, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. They utilized Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. He was from Thaqif, 
which is the, the Ta'if. He was originally from Ta'if, which is a city above Mecca. And he was one of those, he was just ruthless. He was a ruthless leader that nobody could ever talk to. So when he took over uh, the area, Iraq, he built a palace for himself. And then when the palace was done, he gathered the whole city and he wanted the, the people to see his might. And the people were just walking around the palace looking how amazing this palace was. Hassan al-Basri saw this and he said, this, this, some, this is something that we must speak at this time. So he went and he got up on something and he started giving people a speech about the zuhd in the dunya and the worthlessness of this world. Stop being so impressed with these palaces. Then Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, he saw this and he went, he lost it. He lost it. And he said, none of you answered him. None of you stopped him. They said, it's Hassan al-Basri. At this time, he was a senior, right? Hassan al-Basri, how, how, what are we going to say to him? Okay. Who's, who's going to talk to Hassan al-Basri? So he said, you're all cowards. I'm going to feed you his blood. I'm going to force feed you his blood right now. So he sat in his diwan. The diwan is like the sitting area of the king. And he said, bring me this man. So they brought him. They brought him and they say, be careful. He is fuming. And he said, and, and get the swordsman ready because we're going to slice his neck. So they, they brought him and they brought, okay, they saw him just whispering, dhikr, the whole, a dua the whole time. Nobody could see what he was saying, but his head was down and he was just making dua the entire time. Okay. He says, subhanAllah. And there is a, the, the, the worker of uh, Hajjaj's uh, uh, guards were all around him with the swords. Okay. As soon as they saw him, he, as soon as he entered, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf got up. They saw Hajjaj's face was completely bright with happiness. And he moved and he says, come sit right next to me. Come sit right next to me. Everyone would go shocked. And he honored him and he welcomed him. Okay. And then he says, he says here, and he starts saying, He sat him down. He started putting forth all the questions that he had. In terms of his ruling, because he need he had questions related to, you know, what should we do about this, that, and the other. And now Hassan is answering him back. And after this, he said, You are the chief of all the scholars here. And then he, he, he brought his he brought his secretary of the treasury and he said, go get the best thieb that we have, the which is like the incense. And he brought it and he packed it up and he gave it to Hassan al-Basri as a gift. And then he walked him to the door. He's, then the, the main man, the main, like the prime minister, you could say, or the minister of, or the chief guard of al-Hajjaj. He said, after they were walking out, he said, what did you say? He called you here to do something else. And I saw you whispering something, okay? And by Allah, the swords were ready to cut your neck. So what were you saying? So Hassan al-Basri started, he laughed. He says, لَقَدْ قُلْتْ يَا وَلِيِّ نِعْمَتِي يَا مَلَاذِ عِنْدَ كُرْبَتِي he said, oh, protector of my blessing, which is like my life, and my protector at every trial and tribulation, make his anger, Hajjaj's anger, cool and peaceful in the same way that you made the fire of Ibrahim cool and peaceful. So you see, even the highest level of the governments at that time, they were seeing these karamats with their own two eyes. That's why they had taqwa. I mean, you can't at that point go against that. You can't basically deny the truth of dhikr, truth and the power of deen when you, the, you see it right in front of your face like that. And so that was 
the, from the height of Hassan al Basri that he was one of the only people that was able to stand up to Hajjaj bin Yusuf. He Hajjaj bin Yusuf killed so many people ruthlessly. He was the only one that was able to stand up to him and speak, and literally his heart changed. Hajjaj bin Yusuf never gave Hassan al Basri a problem ever, ever again. Okay, and from the uh, upbringing of al Hassan al Basri is that as soon as he grew up. He started studying with the Sahaba and joining them wherever they joined. And he traveled with the army. He did he did jihad. He fought. And where did he fight? Khurasan, far away. And he spent a lot of time in Kabul. So if you're Afghani out there, all right, you're going to be happy because he spent a lot of time in the city of Kabul. The city of Kabul, subhanAllah, this is an ancient Islamic city. This is not some city that was uh, conquered way later. This is the first generation they had Sahaba there. They had Tabi'in there, okay? And he spent a lot of time in the city of Kabul. When he came back, he decided to settle in the city of Basra, and that's where he got his name, Al-Hassan Al-Basri, okay? His chief disciple was Malik ibn Dinar. And Malik ibn Dinar was the famous soldier. He's got one of the most amazing stories. He was just, a, he was just an officer. He was a low-level officer, of the Umayyads, and he was uh, somebody who was drinking. He was not doing anything good with his life. And then nobody would marry him. Right? No, no, fam no father-in-laws would ever accept him. And so he finally had to take a prostitute and, and marry her. And he did. And in the marriage, he was just like a married man, but you know, still not praying, drinking. And then he had a daughter. And he loved this daughter so much. Then she died at a young age, about five, six, seven years old, like when she could talk, and she died. He said, I became so angry that day that I decided I'm going to get more drunk than I've ever gotten before. And he got so drunk that night that he was in a stupor and he knocked out. There he had a dream of the Qiyamah that he was resurrected and that a beast the size uh, the the body of a bear but the size of a wolf uh sorry the, the the shape of a wolf but the size of a bear could you imagine a wolf right running on four legs but the size of a bear and he said and i was a small man running away from this vicious vicious wolf and this wolf is just right its mouth is like right about to get me and I see an old man. And I, I begged the old man for help. The old man said, look at me. I'm a frail old male. What can I do for you? And I ran, running for my life from this wolf. And I see another old man. And I beg him. And he said, nothing I can do for you. And then finally, I hear my daughter's voice. I hear her voice. She's saying, father, come here, come here. And I look and I see my daughter at a house and she opens a door and I run into the door and she closes the door and I'm safe and she turns to me and she says father isn't it time for the believers for their hearts to soften to the awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so your, your heart should ha soften with awe to what Allah has revealed and then he woke up. He woke up. That wolf was his bad deeds. That old man was his good deeds. So immediately he was woke up in a complete sweat. He ran, made ghusl, made wudu, ran to the masjid. He was the first one in the masjid that day for Fajr. He gets in and prays with everybody else. He's in the first row. And the imam recites Surah Al-Fatiha, and then opens the Surah, and the first verse that he recites is, أَلَمْ يَأْنِي لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ Immediately, he faints. I mean, this is not a man who's accustomed to this, work with the unseen. But he saw it directly. From that moment on, 
he began his journey. And Malik ibn Dinar began merely as a musalli with Hassan al-Basri. Musalli, just someone who prays five times a day. That was a big deal for him. Just pray five times a day. Then sit in the gathering. Then can I get you something? He became a khadim. He was a servant. And then a student. And then an assistant. And then he became the imam after Hassan al-Basri. He became his number two man. Okay. Over a span of years and years and years of studying with Hassan al-Basri and serving him. Okay. Then as Malik ibn Dinar became came of age, you see this is how Allah takes someone's bad deeds and makes them into good deeds. He was known for bringing drunkards off the street and into the masjid. That's how you turn your bad deeds into good deeds, is by the idea and the concept that you use what you understood, what you learned. Okay. Now, despite you shouldn't have done that, but even if you did do that, you did learn something, right? You learned something about the mentality of a drinker, et cetera, et cetera. So he would bring them off and he would have mercy for them and bring them into the masajid and, and, make, and they would make tawbah with him. Okay. He would make tawbah with them. Hassan al-Basri at that time, him and Sufyan al-Thawri, was younger than him, they would visit Rabi al-Adawiyah and they would exchange wisdom with her, right? And Rabi al-Adawiyah was a woman that was so ascetic, she was so zahid that she viewed Hassan al-Basri as a man of dunya. And he said that Sufyan and that Hassan al-Basri would leave weeping. They would leave their house weeping, and her house, or, or the visit with her, weeping, saying, we are people of dunya, we are people of dunya, right? That's what they, how much uh, that, for example, one time, she said, give me a wisdom. Yeah, say something wise. He said, whoever knocks on the door of Allah Ta'ala, it will, eventually it will, it will open. Whoever keeps, man lazama qar al bab futihala. Whoever persists on knocking on the door of Allah, it will be opened. Meaning in dua, in toba, whatever it is that you're seeking. Her answer to him was, and since when is it closed? Right? So they, she would always be one, one step ahead of them in zuhud. That's Rabia al adawiyah And then Hassan al-Basri, he has a lot of wisdoms. Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, the great Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, he was a Khalifa, and he would ask him for advice. And I don't know if he was Khalifa at the time. Hassan Basri was alive. I think that's after. But during his life, he would ask him for advice. And he gave him a great piece of advice. He says, This is a really great piece of advice. Hassan, he says to him, he says, the one who uh, it keeps your company, he's not going to give you good advice. He's not going to be your advisor. And the one who advises you okay, is not going to keep your company. Which means like if you have a group of friends and one of your friends goes like a, he needs some piece of advice, right? It's awkward for friends to give friends advice, right? It is. It's true. It's awkward for a friend to give another friend a piece of advice. But it's easy for a stranger to give. I mean, if someone comes to me and they're a complete stranger, it's very easy for me to say, look, this is your problem, right? You need to do this, 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 this. I'm never going to see them again right? It's easy for them to take it too, because they don't have to see me again. But if you're, if you're a companion with people, if you keep the company of people for a long period of time, okay, it's hard for now to keep, to give them advice. You, you have a different relationship. Giving hard advice is difficult. And that's why if you notice, let's say like if a man moves into an area, he moves in and it was with dynamite. He's blowing everything up. This is wrong. This is wrong. Yeah, yeah, this, is wrong. this is haram. Everything's haram because he doesn't know anybody, right? But give it five, six, seven years. Now they're friends. Now they visit. Now they, they see each other all the time. He's got to tone it down a little bit because he's got to go. He's got to run the marathon with them, right? He's got to run a marathon with these people, with his community, with his friends, okay? So his advice to them is going to be extremely slow and gentle, right? Which may or may not be a good thing. So usually you find that. So when, some, when there's a, a great distance between people, it's easy for them to give bad, uh, hard advice, right? But whenever they're, as soon as they become close together, it's, you can't just give that acid, right? You can't, that, you, you can't just give them that really tough, uh, tough advice anymore, okay? So that's a great wisdom. That's the, another one of his wisdoms. The happiest you'll ever be is when you put down the dunya, when you reject the dunya. He says that's the happiest of it. And then he says an, another uh, amazing piece of advice. He said, how terrible are two friends 
the dinar and the dirham, the gold coin and the silver coin. He says, well, why are they bad friends? They only benefit you when you separate from them, right? There's no benefit of money if it's in your pocket. It only benefits you when you spend it. It's extremely wise, right? Sayyidina Ali has another amazing uh, wisdom. He says, knowledge is better than money. You have to protect money, but knowledge protects you. Knowledge benefits you when you acquire it. Money benefits you when you spend it. Right. Be with people however you want to be with people because that's how they're going to be with you. If you're somebody who is always bringing negativity, they're going to bring negativity to you someday. If you're always someone who's uplifting, they're going to uplift you someday. He says, nothing has humiliated the dunya and exposed it for what it is like death. Okay, so if you have any ever problems with the dunya, then flee to death, meaning the contemplation of death. All right. وَسَأَلَهُ رَجُلٌ فَقَالَ لَهُ يَا أَبَا سَعِيدٌ مَا الْإِيمَانِ A man came and said, Abu Sa'id, that was his, his nickname, his kunya. What is iman? He قال الصبر والسماحة Iman is patience and forgiveness. فقال يا أبا سعيد ما الصبر والسماحة So explain to me, how are the, is that connected to iman? الصبر عن معصية الله Patience on the disobedience of Allah والسماحة بأداء فرائض الله Oh, oh, samaha here not being forgiveness, meaning um, happiness, like willing, willingly doing it. He says, willingly fulfilling the obligations of Allah. All right. So from the Sahaba that were his teachers, Anas bin Malik was his biggest teacher. Jabir ibn Abdullah was one of his biggest teachers. Okay. Jundu ibn Abdullah, you see his name in the Ahadith. All right. Um, Az Zubair ibn Awam, he saw him when he was. A senior, as, as Zubair was much older than him. Sa'ad, the servant of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Look, look at his link, how close he is. Okay. Abdullah bin Abbas. He met Umar Om, ibn Khattab as a baby, uh, not, uh, not, uh, only as a baby, but he did, as a child, was around Uthman ibn Affan. Okay. Ali ibn Abi Talib was in his, in his teenage years, he was around Ali and Hassan and Hussein. Ammar ibn Yasar. Okay. Uh, Amr ibn al-As, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, Abu Huraira, uh, but he, it is said that he didn't uh, narrate from Abu Huraira. And then uh, his mother Khaira was also a Sahabiya. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things that he did is he never ever went to uh, the civil wars of the Muslims. He avoided the civil wars between the Muslims. Okay. So this is an amazing, uh, the amazing life and times of Hassan Basri. Now, in Hadith, Hassan al-Basri is that he has something called Marasil al-Hassan. And Marasil al-Hassan are viewed by scholars in two different ways. What is, what is a Mursal Hadith, first of all, is when you skip a Sahabi, when you quote the Prophet directly, all right? And so he's quoting the Prophet, but he's not quoting who he took it from. So the scholars are of two opinions. One is that, we can't accept it because he doesn't quote he, who he quotes from. The other is that you can't accept it because on the one hand, none of his mursal hadiths, they're usually, they're usually not about fiqh. They're about zuhud. They're about tafsir or stories or zuhud, right? A hadith related to that are not necessarily legalistic hadiths. Secondly, they say, who did he take from? Like he's only probably skipping a sahabi, right? He's probably only skipping a sahabi. And therefore, it's acceptable. So some people, there, there, people, scholars go two ways on the marasil al Hassan. It's a famous theme in a subcategory of study on the uh, uh, the, the the hadith of Hassan. Let's Hassan al Basri. Let's read about his death. Shahidu Hassan al Basri inda mautihi. Abu Tariq al Saadi says, "Yusi fakala li katib." He was given. He had a writer, and he was dying. He was on his deathbed. And he had a writer. He says, "Uktub hada ma yashhadu bihi al-Hasan ibn Abi al-Hasan yashhadu anna la ilaha illa Allah." Write down that Hasan, the son of Abu al-Hasan, because his father's nickname was Abu al-Hasan, Yasar. Okay. He says that Hasan says, "La ilaha illa Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah, wa man shahida biha sadiqan 'inda mauti dakhla al-jannah." And that whoever truly says this from his heart, he enters paradise. 
ولما حضرته الوفاة جعل يسترجع when he was dying literally the moment of death is coming he kept saying إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ فَقَامَ إِلَيْهِ إِبْنُهُ فَقَالْ his son got up and he says father you're worrying us why are you saying that that's what you say that when you say something bad right إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ we see in the disaster so when your father is saying that on his deathbed isn't that scary right فَهَلْ رَأَيْتَ شَيْئًا he said did you see anything right he said, it's my nafs. I'm afraid. I have not been afflicted with anything like it. All right? So he's like, I'm worried about my nafs. So what is our state with Allah Ta'ala? It's fear and hope. How do you combine fear and hope? They're opposites. It's fear of our sins and hope in Allah's mercy. That's how you combine fear and hope. I'm afraid for my sins, but I hope in my mercy. وَقَالَ رَجٌ لِبْنِ سِرِينَ رَأَيْتَ كَأَنَّ طائرا اخذا الحسن حصاه في المسجد فقال له ابن سيرين ان ان صدقت رؤياك مات الحسن okay. i saw a bird اخذا الحسن right. taking الحسن right. in from the mosque a bird taking hasan from the mosque he said if it's true then he died right فلم يلبث الا and very shortly after that, he died. Okay. He died the night between of Friday, meaning between Thursday and Friday, as we are today, which is inshallah going to be the latest in this human Shaban. And so his janaza was um, after Jum'ah, and then he, which is always the best janazah because it's packed all right i'm just uh, okay what kind of and and people the entire city was at the graveyard during asr to the point that the jama'a prayer was not established in the basra mosque the main bus mosque of basra the jama'a prayer was not established there because the entire city was at the graveyard burying al hassan al basri okay um and he died Ashra Wamia, the year one ten. Wa Umruhu Tisa with Amanuna Sana. He was eighty nine years old, and some say sit with Tisauna. Well, you can calculate it. He was born in the eighth year, in the tenth year of the Hijra, right? And then he died in a hundred and ten. So then um he should have been a hundred years old. Okay. So there's always different on the death dates. What kind of Hasr and Basri? إلى جانب ورعه شجاعا زا شجاعا زاهدا شجاعا زاهدا فيما عند الملوك فرغبوا فيه. He he didn't care about the emirs, so they want him. When people don't care about you, you tend to want them. The dunya is like that. If you don't want what they have, they want you. Okay. And he was extremely sincere to the Muslims, so they loved him. All right. He was sincere in his advice to the Muslims, so they loved him for that reason. So that is the great. Hassan al Basri and and his story. Jazakumullah khair, folks. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta s-sami'u al-alim wa tub alayna innaka anta t-tawab al-rahim. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta s-sami'u al-alim wa tub alayna innaka anta t-tawab al-rahim. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta s-sami'u al-alim wa tub alayna innaka anta t-tawab al-rahim. وصلى الله وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل لي صلاه كامله وسلم سلاما تاما على سيدنا محمد الذي تنحل به العقد وتنفرج به الكرب تقضى به الحوائج تنال به الرغائب وحسن الخواتم ويستسقى الغمام بوجهه الكريم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك نسال الله العفو والعافيه والسلام والرحمة لنا ولجميع أمة الإسلام ومن أعاننا على هذا البث المباشر وصلى الله وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين